But the question we're going to try and answer today is, are we there yet? And, and what we're talking about here is, are we there yet in terms of adding small caps back to our portfolios? Let's look at the background. So let's start with why small caps? Why consider small caps in your portfolio at all? Well, it's pretty clear from this chart that over 20 years, the median active manager has done a good job of delivering excess returns relative not only to the small cap index, which doesn't look that appealing actually versus the ASX 300, but more importantly versus the ASX 300 index. So the role in a client's portfolio of small caps, of active small caps, is to deliver those higher returns from a part of the market that a lot of uh, large cap managers tend not to venture into. But it's not necessarily a smooth ride. Stand back here. Um, <coughs> So you can see here, these are the rolling five-year excess returns of the median small cap manager versus the ASX 300. And over a long period of time, the performance is there. And in some times, coming out of recessions particularly, and you'll remember that chart from Marcus's presentation, the returns from small caps can be very strong. But there are other times, like in 08, 2017, and now, where small caps have struggled. And so the question we're trying to ask ourselves is, does this look like a good opportunity to think about adding small caps into a client portfolio? There's a lot of fear about macro. There's a lot of fear about recessions, mortgage cliffs, lots of macro concerns. And so we thought we'd go and look at what happened to small caps in other situations to answer the question of whether we're close to the beginning or the end of how much of these macro fears may be reflected in small cap share prices today. So let's start with the tech bubble bursting. So we're starting here at the, the highest point of small cap versus large cap outperformance in the beginning of 2000. And these are index versus index returns. So it's the small cap index against the ASX 300. And you can see that it was a pretty rough ride in terms of that underperformance. It took 18 months for small caps to stop underperforming and they underperformed by 35% over that period. So it was a lot of pain for investors to endure investing in the small cap index, as the market was concerned about a recession that didn't end up happening here in Australia. We had one quarter of negative GDP, but we did have a recession globally. So that recession fear did get baked into small caps, and that's what that journey looked like. Let's look at the GFC. It felt a lot worse than what that chart looks like. Having lived through it and running a small cap fund at the time, it did not feel like from peak to trough it was 15 months. But that was the period over which small caps underperformed in Australia at the index level. And they underperformed a lot less than they did after the tech bubble bursting. So not quite 25%. And then small caps stopped underperforming versus large caps. And you can see we've got the beginning of, of those charts that Marcus showed. As the markets recover, small caps start to do well. And we'll see in another chart you know, that overlaid in terms of the overall market bottoming. Now, interestingly, if you go back in time, it's also very hard to actually pin down and recognise what was the catalyst? What was it that caused small caps to stop underperforming? What was the green light that said to you, now's the time to go back into small caps? Most people, having endured that pain, felt pretty fearful about the continuation of that experience. And so that brings us to the current scenario, or the situation we find ourselves in today. From October 2021, we're now 16 months into this level of index underperformance, and we've now surpassed the level of underperformance that we saw in the GFC from the small cap index versus the large cap index. So it seems like looking at a chart like this, uh, do we need to become market timers? Do we need to figure out you know, when to pull the lever to allocate in and out of small caps? Um, are we closer to the end than the beginning? Do these other analogs give us some indication? Well, we're not here to talk about market timing, we're, talking, we're here to talk about perhaps a better way of integrating small caps into your portfolio without having to make those decisions. And that's looking at the performance of active small cap funds in the same period. So the first chart we saw, we saw that active small cap funds do better over time. But the other thing that's important is when they do better and, and the ride that they give to investors um, as these challenging markets turn up. And so that first chart, over on the far left here, this is now monthly data because that's where we have the index, um, sorry, the median manager return series. We can see that's the, in black, the index underperforming the ASX 100, so small cap versus large cap, but the median manager did a lot better. The maximum drawdown was limited to about 10%, and actually by the time the overall market bottomed in early 2003, which is that dashed red line, 
the median small cap manager was well and truly ahead of large caps. So you're already being paid well to have stuck with that manager through that journey. The second example we gave in the GFC, not quite as impressive, but active managers did also improve both the drawdown and the duration of underperformance. So again, allowing uh, investors to stick with their investment program rather than having to figure out when to time markets and, and find signals that, that might work. Um, and like a lot of active managers, that's not what we spend our time doing. We spend our time on the stocks, not on the top-down macro uh, views. And then finally, where are we today? So this is the current period, again, surpassing that GFC experience at the, at the index level. Median manager hasn't done as well this time, and maybe in the Q&A we can talk a bit about why that might be and, and what the environment was a couple of years ago that led to that. But we've been quite pleased with the long wave small cap fund performance that has managed to, to sort of curtail that level of drawdown versus the ASX 300. So active managers do help answer that question of when do we add small caps back to our portfolio by finding managers who can perform through the market cycle rather than having to allocate, you know, sell and buy and try and time the market. So where to invest? Where in this market with all these macro concerns do we allocate our capital inside small caps? Now like Marcus um, and Jill talked about before, we don't take a top-down view of sector allocations. We think about the bottom up. And in small caps, that's really important, and I'll show you why. For a lot of investors coming into the back half of last year, and these numbers show earnings expectations from June 2022 until the end of reporting season, a lot of investors would have said on a top-down basis, why on earth would you buy consumer discretionary stocks? The consumer is slowing down, interest rates are rising, mortgage is going to reset. The problem in small caps is that the dispersion of how the companies perform far outweighs any of those macro influences. And so the performance of Lovisa and Super Retail and Accent relative to the performance of, of Kogan and Baby Bunting and BWX had nothing to do with what the RBA was doing. It was mostly down to how the company managements were executing and delivering earnings growth to their shareholders. And on the other side, you might say, well, let's invest in healthcare companies because they're top-down defensive. <coughs> they have non-discretionary sources of income. But if you had invested in Australian Clinical Labs or Integral Diagnostics or Helios, the earnings performance, <coughs> and you can imagine the share price performances, would have done the complete opposite of what you were hoping that they were going to achieve for you in your portfolio. A couple more quick examples there. So financials, which are often thought of, of, uh, thought of as market leveraged in a place you don't want to be. Huge dispersion between the earnings winners and the earnings losers in, in that group. And finally, consumer staples, the safe part of the market where people would go outside of sort of consumer discretionary to get that defensive characteristic, um, we see the same pattern. Now we've taken a bit of license here, A2 milk isn't technically a small cap, but the fact that uh, a dairy converter was you know, minus 40 and plus 21 percent in terms of earnings change really brought to bear just how much the individual company performance matters in terms of the change in earnings. So that's why we focus on the companies and we don't focus on the macro. We'll talk quickly about lithium. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, speculation and valuation in parts of the market that we believe aren't justified. Lithium is one of them. A couple of years ago, there were different sectors that shared those characteristics. And really what we're saying here, and Marcus alluded to it um, earlier, is that it's just a mining industry, right? Like there is a lot of growth in the end use, but mining industries tend to be driven by demand and supply. And so lo and behold, when lithium went into surplus um, five or six years ago, the lithium price dropped about 70%. And then when the lithium market went into deficit through to last year, we saw this massive spike in prices, which is now starting to unwind because we're going back into a balanced market and maybe a surplus. So, you know, when we look at businesses and companies and the enthusiasm that the market applies, we have to remind ourselves there are real businesses and industries underneath those themes, and we need to understand what it is we're investing in. Now, I don't intend to go through this whole table, but all I'm really showing here is that the assumptions that you have to make, and these are, these are unnamed lithium development companies, with a series of assumptions about how much it will cost to build the mine, the long-term lithium price assumption they use, and ultimately what that's worth in terms of NPV, 
I mean, these numbers are all over the place. You know, the CapEx blowouts that they've seen, the change in the lithium price assumptions that they're using, and ultimately the changes in MPVs, and these are all assumptions in a spreadsheet, right? We can't observe any of this yet. And this here, this sort of green bar, that's the range in just three years of the long-term lithium price assumptions used by just two of these companies. So when we talk about avoiding speculative companies in the market, it's companies that are built on assumptions and haven't demonstrated and shown us as investors how they deliver the unit economics of their business models. But maybe you like the electric vehicle idea. Maybe you sit there and think, this is real. Like the, the penetration of EVs is gonna continue to grow. Is there another way of getting exposure to that? Well, here's uh, two companies that we own. One on the right we've got more detail on, but two companies that we own that are big beneficiaries of the increase in penetration of electric vehicles. And partly due to a change in government policy last year, where they said, as per the quote at the top, that if you buy an EV through a novated lease, you can pay for it in pre-tax dollars regardless of how you use that car, right? So it's FBT exempt, so long as the EV is under the luxury car tax threshold. And Smart Group and Macmillan Shakespeare are two of the leading novated lease providers in Australia. And the chart to the left is showing you from Smart Group's full year result that came out last month, just how much the level of inquiries are coming through into their business. And as a result of that government policy change, that's expected to only continue. On the right here, we sort of now talk about, well, what's happening inside the company? Is this just another lithium story that sounds good, but we're taking all these unknown risks? So these are the actual reported segment profits of Macmillan Shakespeare and then our forecast as to what we think they'll do in the future. So we think in the combination of their packages and leases business and their NDIS plan management business, that Macmillan Shakespeare will grow earnings at 15% per annum for the next five years. And we get to buy that today at 15 times earnings. It's a business that generates a 30% ROE and prodigious cash flow comes out of it. It's very low debt on the balance sheet. So we don't need to take all this speculative risk invest in companies that are completely unproven if we can find strong cash producing businesses with a history and track record so we can understand how the business works for reasonable values. The second set of opportunities that we're interested in today um, are around travel and leisure. Uh, and we think there's still opportunity in a number of stocks in small caps in, in this sector. So the chart to the left comes from the Qantas uh, first half result presentation. And it's just their indication of where they think we are in terms of the travel cycle. So in their view, we're still about halfway between the COVID lows and where 2019 levels of activity were. And they expect it'll take until about 2025, fiscal year, for us to be back to those 2019 levels. So what we look at on the right here then is the valuations in a very crude sense or the market pricing of a range of small cap tourism and leisure stocks and where their earnings are likely to be in 2025 versus where they were in 2019. So the grey bars here are saying that other than for Webjet, most of these companies are priced by the market within 10% of where they were in 2019. But their earnings in 2025, for many of them, are either slightly or significantly above where they were in 2019. So we still find some pretty compelling opportunities in the tourism and leisure small cap space, and we own a number of names on that chart. So Mark mentioned that long wave are different and we're different in a couple of important ways. But for us, our differences really only matter for the client outcome that we produce. And so what we're showing on the left here is the benefits of having a highly diversified quality portfolio and the ability to generate excess returns. And so that chart is simply the excess return at a, at, at cumulatively over time of our fund versus our benchmark, and it goes back to the predecessor fund that we ran at Schroeder's before starting Long Wave. Um, and it looks at that in different market environments, in a value market, in a growth market, we could show industrial or resource-led markets, up or down markets. The idea is to, to build a portfolio that performs in a lot of different market environments and doesn't take excessive risk on any one stock or sector or theme or factor. So it's very diversified in terms of the way we put the portfolio together. The second feature, which is a bit unique about the long wave strategy, um, and you know, we hear that not every uh, advisor and client cares about the fees they pay for active fund managers, 
but for those that do, we have a, a fee class that starts at 89 basis points with no performance fee and reduces over time as the funds under management in the unit class grow. So we think that's a compelling point of difference as well. So overall, the portfolio um, and our approach is pretty simple. You know, we try and buy good quality businesses and don't pay too much. We diversify our risk across a lot of businesses we find that meet those characteristics. And so one of the tests is whether the characteristics of our portfolio marry up to what we're trying to find in the market. And so you can see here, in terms of quality, return on equity, um, the debt metrics, like with the Sferia guys, debt and, and low leverage is very important to us. Um, all markers of high quality businesses. And in terms of value, you know, we've got a portfolio that's priced cheaper than the market today, despite having better quality characteristics. So I said up front that you know, there's the potential to find a different way of answering the question, are we there yet? And we think having quality active managers in small caps help answer that question of being able to allocate sooner and get the benefits as the market turns um, as small caps will eventually outperform again. Thank you.